Okay, so we are on Finding God's Will Part 3. Um, we have, after tonight, I believe we have th two more after tonight, if I'm remembering correctly. So there's a, there's a few things when we're talking about God's will that, that's kind of important. And, and I think one of those things is sometimes we talk about what's God's will or finding God's will, but we actually don't stop and ask the question, what is it? What is God's will? What's this thing that we're supposed to be finding? For some people, it's an uncontrollable providence. So basically, um, it's something you cannot avoid or can't sidestep or anything. It's just going to happen. It's you know going to be directed by God, and there's nothing you can do about it. In which case, what's the point of worrying about it? <laughs> then for some people, it's something God grudgingly allows or consents to. Like maybe it's not really what God wants, but it must have been his will because he allowed it to happen. And for this, they say, well, if it happened, it must have been God's will. And so it's like, well, okay, so that means, you know, it was God's will for Adam and Eve to sin. It's God's will for pe for people to fall away. It's God's will, you know, that, that false shepherds come and that kind of stuff. It's God's will for all this stuff. And it's like, well, surely God's will isn't so flippant. Then for some people, it's something that God desires that you may or may not keep from him. Like, for instance... Well, God really desired that you did that, but you didn't do it, and God was really, you know, he wasn't able to get what he wanted. Like, kind of like, um, kind of like he's a big child who doesn't get what he wants, and you know, it kind of had it's this kind of idea that that God, um, that God is kind of somewhat answerable to us. Like, what we do affects, you know, what God gets in His will or not, and that kind of makes God, you know, obviously not real. Powerful in that view. For some people, it's just something that God plans to do. Okay, like for instance, uh, God plans for Jesus to come back again. This is God's will, and that that's true in part, but it's not the whole picture. Um, for some people, it's a predestined path you must discover through mystical encounters. Sometimes through the use of occultic activity like Ouija boards. Sometimes just through more mystical means like you know looking for a sign and that kind of stuff. Um, but for some people, it's just something that just keeps us, uh, um, I don't know how else to say this. It's something that keeps us from messing up. Like, let me think of a different way to say that. Well, I'm going to come back and say something that's kind of simple, kind of similar, so I don't want to waste too much time. I'll go ahead and just drop that one. And we'll come back to it. Um, I don't want to waste too much time, and I feel like if I go too much in, I'm just going to... So the biggest issue with a lot of these views on God's will, uh, besides the fact that it isn't really defined, you know, we're talking about, oh, I have to find God's will, but we don't really know what it is that, what is God's will? What is it that we're seeking? What is it that, you know, is it something that we can miss? Is it something that we can't miss? And so we have all these questions that aren't really answered, just because we want to have a purpose in life, and we want to have direction in life, and so we keep talking about, oh, I have to find God's will, and like it's something hidden, like you know, God's playing some kind of giant treasure hunt or something. And uh, the another thing that goes alongside of this is our idea of, well, of manipulating God. So, in the ancient world, there was a lot of you know pagan worship and that kind of stuff. And for these different uh, pagan tasks, they would have different ways of finding God or the God's wills. Um, and one, for some of these, for instance, I have here uh, a little bit lower, things like divination, you know, t uh, reading the stars. They, and Babylonians, for instance, had books on reading the stars. And um, uh, fortune telling, uh, seances is, is some, something that a lot, of, a lot of times people turn to. Some way of defining, you know, finding out what this hidden will of God is. Um, you see that a good example of this is, is King Saul, right? He's at the end of his life. His prophet Samuel has died, and there's no one else he can go to. So he, he kind of, in, a, in an act of desperation, he searches out a witch, and uh, she does this seance. <laughs> And uh, Samuel actually shows up at the seance, and that kind of scares the crap out of the witch because typically it's not a, a, the real person that comes at a seance. It's typically a, a, a demon. So that kind of scares the crap out of her. She's like, ah, you're, you're Saul. Why have you deceived me? And uh, so here's the big issue is that rather than walking closely with God, which is what he desires, uh, we want a quick fix and special signs. You know what I mean? So instead of just seeking God, well, I, I, I want to know what to do in this situation. What's the best course of action in this decision? And here's the thing. You, you need to know that when, whenever you're dealing with life, 
there is an element of risk. You can't avoid it. That, that's just a fact of life. Every decision in life has an element of risk. And some decisions you make are not going to be good. But what we try and do is we try to and, and find the perfect path and say, oh, God, show me your will. And what we really mean is show me the most prosperous decision that I can make. So, I mean, I don't want to... I don't want to make the dumb mistake and be the dummy, you know, <laughs> you know and that's really what we're saying. Um, the other reason why we go to God's will oftentimes is, once again, just because we don't really want to put forth the time and effort to get to know God and to walk with him, we don't really want to read our Bibles, we don't really want to pray. That sounds like a lot of work, and I don't really have the time or patience for that. So instead, we want God to just show us his will, his, you know, his mystical will, so that way we don't have to do all that. We don't have to hop through all the loops. We don't have to actually have a relationship with God. Who wants that? Instead, we just get like the, 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 well, this is just the way to go and all these special signs. I actually um, known a lot of people who, well, I'm looking for a sign and then they'll walk by, some, they'll walk by something like a billboard advertising and then, that's the sign. And it's like, oh, well, that's actually talking about a type of cream. I believe it's for sore skin, but okay. Um, and in the ancient world, pagans did, did a lot of these kinds of things. So they attempted to manipulate God into a certain action through prayers. Now, how often have you or somebody you know acted like this was what prayer was like, right? You have to have the perfect prayer. You have to say it the right way. You have to say it with the right attitude. And that way you can manipulate God into answering your prayer. But the truth in, in Christianity is that prayer, the words that you say, they have no power to them. They're completely powerless. The only thing that gives our prayer any meaning is the God who hears the prayer. That's the difference in Christianity. In paganism, it's, you know, you have these special prayers and you you do this on this and you do this for good luck. And, you know, you read the entrails of the animals and all this stuff. And it's, it doesn't work like that in, in, in God's book. <laughs> you ask and, and then God, who is all powerful and merciful, decides, you know, what to do from there. Um, so they attempted to manipulate God into certain actions through prayers. But another thing that they did is they tried to read signs, like I mentioned, uh, reading the entrails of animals or, you know, liver spots. It was a big thing. Uh, if a bird uh, flew on a certain day in a certain place, and that would mean this, you know, and all these little hidden things, and you had to decipher the code correctly. And they, and they had many people dedicated to this task of just deciphering the hidden signals. But in Christianity, that's completely not the way that God shows us to do it. And uh, although you wouldn't know that because most Christians still look for mystical signs and they, and they hope that to, to read it correctly. Like I, one person, I, uh, my, I had this professor back in college and he mentioned that there was this woman who said, I'm reading my Bible backwards and God's just showing me so many things. And he said, yeah, I bet you're seeing some things. The Bible was meant to be read backwards. And I do mean backwards, like not, not book wise, not revelations through Genesis. I mean, the end of the book to the beginning of the book. Like starting in chap Rome, Revelation in chapter 20, what is it, 2 or 1 or whatever, and then going like that. And I'm not sure if she was reading the sentences backwards or just verse 20, then verse 19. I, mean, like, I don't know which way she meant. But either way, it was just like, yeah. I, it's, it's like, here's a good example of that. Um, people used to play music uh, backwards and see if there was hidden music, you know, and all these different people were secret Satan worshippers, like Michael W. Smith was secretly worshipping Satan on one of his albums because some of the words on the back cover was backwards. Or something, I don't know. And anyways, uh, and all these mystical signs that you have to really make sure to read them correctly to, to decipher God's will. And it's just not that complicated. Finding your purpose in life is not that complicated. We'll, we'll look at that in just a couple of weeks, but we just need to get rid of all the mysticism. Um, and then another idea that still sticks with people is the idea of being good enough. And, you know, we're Christians, we say, you know, hey, we're not saved by works, but by faith. And yet we still try to earn, you know, some something for, you know, by being good enough. And I don't know where we've gotten confused about this, but it's just something that keeps coming up. We want to somehow say that we are in control still, that somehow we can just prove that we're good enough. And then God will have to answer us. Um, one thing that, that is mentioned frequently when we're talking about finding God's will is people bring up the Urim and Thummim in the Old Testament. Well, there, there's a few th problems with this. First off, we don't exactly know what it was. And second off, we don't have a copy of this Urim and Thummim, so there's that. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's also the big issue that those were used in the Old Testament and mostly as a last resort. God was very clear that he was going to speak through the mercy seat on, on the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, there were just some things where, where there was kind of not really capable for them to do that. So they would use, obviously, this. But the big issue of this is that it was discontinued in the New Testament when um, when we switched from the law to the Spirit. And Paul talks about this a lot. Um, 
And that's kind of the big thing at Pentecost. And the beginning of Acts is the only circumstance before the Holy Spirit was given that we find something ha happens to them. They say, hey, uh, who should take Judas's place? And they, it says that they cast lots to find out. That is the last time that the New Testament church did it. Because after that was Pentecost, and God substituted that with the Holy Spirit. And it brought us out of the law, which was the only way that we had any permission to use the Urim and Thummim, into the Pentecost, the, the Spirit, the, the, the new law. And so that definitely changed things. Um, so a lot of times, you're going to find that a lot of times Christian mystics will resort to paganisms. Not just in what I talked about with, you know, finding God's will, but they'll also resort to cultic activity and then justify it by, you know, oh, we're, we're free from the law, so that means we can do these really immoral things. And it's like, well, that's not really how it works. Mm -hmm. um, so here's just an example uh, from my own life. So when I was a kid, I was looking for God's will. I didn't really find anything. Once again, I didn't really know what I was looking for either. Was I looking for my purpose or, you know, what was I actually looking for? So I was looking for God's will. I didn't really find anything. It was a lot of frustration, a lot of prayers that really ended in just, once again, frustration. Uh, and I, I, so I made a bunch of plans, and those all fell through. You know, I was going to be a really successful person, just so you guys didn't know. <laughs> well, I ended up here instead. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then throughout the course of my ministry, I faced pretty much nothing but difficulty after difficulty. I'm not, not complaining. Just saying that that's the way it is. My point being, a lot of times people say, well, finding God's will, there will be no difficulty. That's not true. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. But, and uh, then throughout the whole process, even though I was facing a lot of difficulty, I was still blessed by God. So that brings up the question, well, you know, we kind of have it in our heads that if God's going to bless us, that means we're not going to have any problems. And that's just not the way it works either. Um, and then there's the issue that I was equipped for the task. I came here as a worship leader. I am very equipped to do music. God equipped me for the task. I had the guitar. I had the had the equipment to be able to do the task. See what I mean? The skills. Uh, right, right. The, the God, you know, definitely does open doors, and you know, He's the one who gives us our, our talents. Um, so I'm left with this: that life is complicated and doesn't go according to plan. But I have no reason to believe that I'm not in God's will. Make sense? Now keep this and keep that idea in mind because we're going we're gonna to build off that uh, in the next couple of weeks. But uh, let's let's look at things. So I'm going to give you five simple steps to find God's will. Five very simple steps. And keep in mind that as we go, you know, uh, here's the thing: finding God's will is more about who you are than what you do. When you read in the New Testament, whenever Paul's talking about finding God's will, he talks about how it's you know that we're thankful. He talks about that a lot. He talks about that we endure, that that's God's will for us, that we, you know all these different things. And that's what he talks about in God's will. He doesn't say, um, you know, that you need to go into your prayer closet and get this mystical, you know, thing. It's just not really how it works. Um, in fact, we have very few examples of people in the in the Bible being called by mystical means. Um, Paul is the big example that everybody knows of. <laughs> But obviously that doesn't mean that everybody um, did. So, num step number one, and this is the basis of the whole kit and caboodle. Read your Bible. The Bible has to be the basis for, for truth. It has to be the basis of your anchor. Because look at this. You're thinking, you're going to think wrong at different times. Anybody who's had depression can know this right off the bat. You're going to think things that aren't true. You're going to feel things that aren't true. So that brings us, our logic isn't always true because we don't have full understanding of any given situation. But then also our emotions we can't lean on them. So these are both shifting sands. So then we might say, well, what about leading on society? Well, society changes every couple of years. That's not a very good standard. But if the Bible really is God's word, then that means it's the only real standard, the only solid ground that we can compare anything to. So uh, let's look at this. First off, there is no shortcut to God developing your character. There is no shortcut. We, we don't want to read our Bibles. We don't want to pray. I have some bad news for you. There is no shortcut to God working character in us. He doesn't want us to be immature children for all of our lives. There's just no way around that. Uh, it's, it's not convenient. It's sometimes not overly fun because maybe God wants us to change something we don't want to change. That's still the way it is. Next, you cannot know his mind without his heart and his spirit. See, there's this idea that if God would just give me his will, his, reveal his mind to me. But what about having his heart and his spirit? Well, we can't have his heart and his spirit if we're not yielding our lives to him. See what I mean? So we're wanting part of the package. We're not wanting the whole thing. It's like, God, I want you to bless me, but I don't really want to walk with you. I don't really want to love you. I don't really want to serve you. 
So you know in, in the law, for instance, when it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? And all, by the way, as you seek after me, I'm going to bless you. And we want to do this. Okay. Scratch all that and just bless me, and we'll all be good. Once again, that doesn't really work. Um, I see a lot of people trying to overcome different issues in their life, and they don't actually want to yield their life to him. But then they want the effects of yielding their life to him. That's, that's not how it works. Um, so the, the typical the, a typical pattern for you to start with is this. Read. There's no, no, no substitute for reading. Don't read books about the Bible. Don't read commentaries. Read the Bible. Now, I'm not saying I shouldn't have said it like that. Commentaries are good. Books about the Bible are good, with exception, obviously, there's the whack jobs like Bill Johnson, you know. For the most part, there are good books about the Bible out there. But still, it cannot take the place of reading the Bible. The second step is interpreting. This is very, very important, and I'll actually, I actually have, have the next slide of, about a quick walkthrough of how to interpret. We've talked about that many times, though. Um, and this is just simply the, the process of taking what you read and applying it to yourself. So then the, third, the third part is, is kind of a, a twofer, memorize and meditate. Meditate just means think about it. Memorize is where you commit it to memory, right? That just helps you kind of internalize what you're reading, helps you pay attention. And then you'll find that as you memorize, God will bring things up to you while when you're going through different circumstances that just apply. Um, and then, you know, obviously you'll see it in, in ways that you didn't see it before. But then also as you meditate on it, you'll find that you, your, your thinking will become a little bit clearer and you'll start to feel yourself change. Um, and then the last stage, this is absolutely essential because it, it makes no difference if you know everything about the Bible and then don't obey God. There actually has to be some kind of a doing of the word that you hear. So 2 Timothy is, is, a, is a part that I'm going to read for this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 14, and we'll go through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you. And you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may, may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, what we think is because we're free from the, from the law of the Old Testament, the whole sacrificing animals, that that means the Old Testament doesn't have anything to teach us. That is just such an incorrect view. And it's just absolutely not true. The Old Testament still does speak to us, as Paul just said. So uh, it definitely is still worth reading. Um, so from these different things, there's something I want to point out. It's God's will that you are mature. He wants you to grow in faith and knowledge and, and, and love and in service. He talks about this throughout Paul's and John's writings. Um, so what God says has to trump over what we say or feel. Most Christians, especially nowadays, follow the exact opposite. I feel this way, therefore that's the way that true. That's what what's true, and that just can't be what's true because we'll oftentimes, once again, feel what's not true. How do we know that what we're feeling is is right and good? How do we know that what we're thinking is right and good? I mean, for instance, it might seem right and good for me one day to kill somebody. Hey, it seems like a good idea to kill them. It might seem right and good to me someday to cheat on my wife. Hey, if it feels right, do it, right? So, I mean, there's just a lot of things you really can't trust yourself on. Oh, well, I would know. Well, you say that, but people always say that, and yet they still mislead themselves into sin. So the basis of everything else has to be reading the Bible. It, it amazes me that very few Christians actually read the Bible, but most Christians are looking for God's will. Doesn't that seem kind of odd? We don't want to read the Bible. We don't really pray. Like if I was to say, hey, by show of hands, who and don't, I don't really raise your hand. Um, who uh, prayed uh, every single day this week and read their Bible every single day this week? Mo I said don't really raise your hand. Uh, the truth is most of us would not be able to answer that with truthfully that is raising our hands, except for Isaiah the hypocrite. No, I'm just kidding, joking, <laughs> joking, joking. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, but then we still want to find God's will, and it's like, you know, you, you can't have one without the other. We want to live for ourselves and then for God to give us, you know, this divine revelation. It just doesn't really work. Um and so real quick, uh, this is the last thing we're going to talk about tonight, and we'll wrap up this lesson, we'll continue with it next week, um, is how to interpret the Bible. Just a real simple walkthrough. Uh, I've talked about it many times. Chuck has talked about it many times. Um, uh, you can get that book that I mentioned by um, – it's called Grasping God's Word. You look it up on Amazon, you'll find it. Um, the first thing, when you read something in the Bible, ask, who is writing? 
Who is doing the writing? Next, who was it written to? You can't understand what it meant if you don't understand who it was written to. And you can't really apply it to yourself if you don't understand the situation that it was written in. Right? Doesn't that make sense? So then that takes you to step three. What genre is this? Like, So for instance, Psalms is poetry. It's not literal, right? When it talks about, uh, in, in different poetic sections, it talks about the trees clapping their hands. They don't really have hands. That would be creepy. A tree is full of hands. Like, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> um, step number four, what is different from then to now? What's what's the difference? Um, you know, how, how, how is that important? How is that difference important? Um, here's a good example. Some people come to certain things in the Old Testament and they say, ah, I'm going to claim this as my blessing. And then when they read the other parts of the Old Testament, which they should equally apply that, since they applied that, they say, oh, no, I'm not going to apply that. Like, you know, for instance, oh, well, God says he's going to bless me and my land is going to be profitable and all this different stuff. And, you know, then, well, what about the whole part about sacrificing animals? Oh, no, that doesn't apply to me. But the blessings apply to you. Okay, like, I don't think it really, you know, you just need to put forth some thought when you're reading it. And I'm not saying that God doesn't doesn't bless us. I'm definitely not saying that. But I, I am saying that we tend to quote God's promises in the Old Testament word for word while we overlook his commands and his uh, curses. So, uh, so I guess that's five. What is the clear meaning of these verses? Not, not what can I twist it to make it mean? Like, so for instance, here's a good example of that. Um, in the book of Exodus, it talks about how they're building the tabernacle. I've literally, excuse me, I've literally seen people go to that and say, well, this is symbolic for this. And the and this part where it's talking about how they took and they hung these curtains, that's symbolic for this. And they make this great mystical thing, uh, this mystical allegory, that's what it's called, an allegory. And the, when if we were to stop and just say, what is the clear meaning of these verses? It's this. They were building the, uh, building the tabernacle. That's the very clear meaning. So then how does that apply to me? See what I mean? And uh, there's just a lot of confusion there. And then the last question, how does it relate to or apply to me? This is something you just keep coming back and coming back to. Um, because obviously we can know, we can know that in Exodus, Moses built the tabernacle. But that doesn't tell us how does this apply to me. For instance, it might be important to note that in Exodus, it mentions very clearly the directions for building the tabernacle and then the fact that they actually built the tabernacle but wedged right between those two events and those two lengthy bits is the part where they build the golden calf. And God says that he will not be with them and he will not go with them to the promised land. So we should stop and ask, hmm, maybe it's trying to say something here. Which, spoiler alert, it is. So, uh, I hope that that is, is a good uh, answer to a few questions. We'll continue next week with what's the next stages. So, this week, stage one, read the Bible. Okay? Now, before we stop, uh, Chuck, did you remember to that thing that you, that note that you made? It was three weeks ago, maybe four. Yes. So, one thing that... Um, God showed me was when I got called into youth ministry at 18 that I may not always do youth ministry and that I may not always just do youth ministry. Like there could be other things or there could be totally different things. Um, and one thing that we kind of see, well I've seen is you see Christians who feel like God has called them into something, and then when that season of their life ends, they don't know where to go. And they feel like their purpose and that sort of thing is over. That's one thing that I had to learn um, as a pastor. Being a pastor is not who I am. I'm Michael. Being a pastor is what I do. See what I mean? And I think that that's something that, that, that Chuck is, is, is saying is, you know, sometimes we, we wrap up our whole significance, our whole worth into into something that God calls us to at a time. And one thing that I want to point out is, is Chuck said that thing, just a second ago, if, if you heard him, that it might not be the only thing. So a good example of that, for instance, I don't know if you guys know this, but Chuck has, for instance, uh, his website, Sheep Among Wolves. And he has a podcast and a YouTube and all that stuff. Uh, you can go check it out. 
uh, Twitter, if any of you guys are on Twitter, I, I don't like Twitter, but I mean, it's a lot of people do. Uh, but anyways, my point being, that's not really youth ministry, is it? And yet, see what I mean? So just because God's calling you to do something, is one thing is, doesn't mean that, you know, you can't do anything. Like, for instance, I like biking. That's not, that's not my job. I just like doing it. And uh, okay, so uh, did anybody have any questions or comments before we finish up uh, tonight? No. One thing uh, that I did pray when God called me into youth ministry and I first started getting into ministry was just for God to use me however He wanted, and I think that's important. Yeah, I think it's not important to just focus on oh, this is my purpose in life. Right. This is who I am. If this dies, then I die. Yeah. Kind of. And we're going to talk more about that when we get to what, what's finding my purpose in life. What's my purpose in life? We're going we're to talk exactly about that and the idea of humility. Two very important ideas. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and stop there. And Gracie has a really fun game for us.